Welcome to the Short Term Show, the show about short term rentals and long term wealth, with real property owners hosting real properties who are crushing it in the vacation and short term rental space. And here's your host, Avery Carl. This episode of The Short Term Show is brought to you by The Short Term Shop. 30-year fixed mortgages, tax benefits, and long-distance management training made easy are just a few of the perks of owning a short-term rental. The Short-Term Shop can help you buy and learn how to manage your property from anywhere in the world. Just go to theshorttermshop.com and click Get Connected. Again, that's theshorttermshop.com, and we are brokered by eXp. See y'all over there. Hey guys, welcome back to The Short-Term Show. Today we have a very special guest, Ryan Bakey. Ryan is an expert in all things taxes related to real estate in general, but short-term rentals specifically. Uh, he has a few companies, MLS Consulting and Learn Like a CPA, and I will let Ryan continue introducing himself from here. How's it going, Ryan? Awesome, guys. Good morning, Avery. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan. I have an accounting and finance background. I went to school for those two degrees. I got into real estate once I got into the working world, and I realized that people who invest in real estate live under a different set of rules than people who don't invest in real estate. And it all started when I worked at my first CPA firm where I did a tax return for a married couple who had made about $250,000 as W2 employees. And then I did a tax return for a single guy who had about 400,000 in cash flow from apartment buildings in Chicago. And he was single he paid less in taxes than the married couple who made half the amount of money that he did. And so he was single, which means he's in a higher tax bracket. And he made almost double the amount of money that they made. Yet he paid less in taxes than they did. And I had asked my boss at the time, I'm like, how does that work? What, what's going on here? And his simple response was, it's because he invests in real estate. And I spent the, ever since that moment, I spent the, you know, my life onward trying to understand how that's possible. And that's how I'm here today. So I left corporate America to help the, not the everyday person, but I wanted to help the person in their family that's going to change their family tree. And that's primarily through wealth building through real estate, but I'm also not opposed to, you know, using retirement accounts, using businesses or using stocks, investments as a form of early retirement, financial freedom. Awesome. So let's let's dive into this really quick. So we've talked about in previous episodes, which uh, guys, if you haven't listened to the Amanda Hahn and Matt McFarland episode for a deep dive on into reps, real estate professional status and material participation, do that. Um, but Ryan, for those who have not listened to that, let's just hit on those two things really quickly. Uh, what is rep status and what is material participation and how does that uh, how does that pertain to the short-term rental loophole? And then we'll get into some other mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, so it's a very long-winded answer, but I'll be here to give it. So before 1986, all the income that people made was lumped under one bucket and it was just considered income. And so whatever income you had and whatever losses that you had just got all put together as one. And so that is what allowed a doctor, a lawyer, a nurse, somebody who's making a lot of money to invest into real estate, generate losses the same way that we do still today, and use those losses to offset their income without any rules or restrictions. And Congress eventually put a stop to that in 1986, where they said, hey, there's two buckets of income. There's non-passive income, which is like W-2, 1099, business income. And then there's passive income, which is generally rental real estate. Well, what happened was a lot of realtors, realtors typically have the best lobbyists in Congress. And they were saying, well, wait a minute, if a doctor has two businesses, one that has income and one that has a loss, he or she's able to offset their income with their loss. But if I'm a realtor and I have rental properties as another business, why am I not able to take the losses from my rental properties against my realtor income? And that's when real estate professional status became a thing in 1993, whereas they said, hey, if you're an agent, if you're a fix and flipper, if you work in property management, construction full time, and you invest in real estate, you're able to take your losses from your real estate. Again, these are not cash flow losses. Instead, these are losses that are generated for tax purposes. I'm still cash flowing, money's still hitting my bank account, 
but I get to tell the IRS that I have a loss. And if I'm a real estate professional, I get to use the loss for my long-term rental, multifamily, apartment buildings, and use that to offset my ordinary business income. And in fact, if I'm married, I could even use my, my losses to offset my spouse's income also, which is a common strategy that we implement at my firm with real estate professional status is you, know, you have one spouse that's out there killing it, you know, making hundred, hundred thousands, millions of dollars a year. And then you have one spouse that is managing all the rental properties, qualifies as a real estate professional, and they're able to use the losses from their rentals to offset their income. And in fact, I have a NFL quarterback that is a client of mine that uses this strategy. He, you know, million, you know, multi-million dollar salary, plays football full-time, cannot qualify as a real estate professional, has a spouse that manages all the rental properties, uses the losses from the rental properties to offset the NFL quarterback's salary. Really cool. And why short-term rentals are, are better than long-term rentals or multifamily for a lot of people is in order to be a real estate professional, you have to come over a lot of hurdles. You have to jump over a lot of hurdles and that being you have to spend a lot of time in real estate. And it's essentially all of your time that you spend on a day-to-day -day basis. And why short-term rentals are better is you do not need to spend all of your time in real estate. You just need to meet a few hurdles, which is number one is your average guest needs to stay seven days or less. It even rhymes too. And then you need to prove that you materially participate in your rental properties, which there's seven different tests, but there's two that most people use. And that will be the either the 500 hour test in all of your rental properties, or somebody could do 100 hours and more than any other person in each property. Awesome. Thank you for that recap. So there's one thing in there that, that we haven't talked about before that I wanted to pull out. So we always talk about, uh, using your losses to offset your W-2 income. So I think what a lot of people don't understand is what is a loss that's generated for tax purposes? Because like you kind of touched on it, you don't mean a loss in cash flow, but what's the difference between a loss in cash flow and a loss generated for tax purposes? Yeah, so the, the primary driver to that is going to be the depreciation expense. And I cover depreciation a lot when I speak at events but depreciation is a non-cash expense that you don't have to come out of pocket for, but you get it as a deduction or an expense, if you will, on your P&L. So I might have a rental property that cash flows me $12,000 a year, but my depreciation is $10,000 a year. And therefore I only have to pay taxes on 2000 as opposed to 12. And a matter of fact, most of the time in the Midwest, your average long-term rental without anything else is not going to show a tax profit until year five or year seven. Typically that's how long-term rentals will work. The, what, what makes short-term rentals interesting, as you know, is they're cash cows and they're gonna generate a profit in year one, uh, barring you know, not a lot of repairs and maintenance or any sort of government shutdowns. We saw clients that had losses in early 2020 just because of the pandemic and the restrictions and people weren't able to rent out their cabins. But other than that, the short-term rental is gonna generate a huge profit and cash flow, And that's why we're going to want to be able to offset it. In addition to depreciation, you're also able to get expenses for a lot of things that are related to that property that you're going to have to spend anyway, mortgage interest, insurance, property taxes, cleaning, you know, landscaping, all the stuff that's making like improving your property and it's making it go up in value, giving it that curb appeal, you're able to get deductions for and use those expenses to lower your income. And it's a super powerful tool. Awesome. So yeah, I just wanted to hit on that really quick because I think some people are like, wait, what's a loss? You know, is, does that mean I'm not, you know, it's not making any money. So I appreciate you hitting on that. Mm -hmm. So we've spent, uh, I think a everybody, oh, cause we're recording this in the end. Oh gosh, I almost said mid October. It's November now. Um, in November of 2022. So a lot of people are scrambling, trying to close on properties and get those placed into service before the end of the year so that they can get those material participation hours so that they can get that cost segregation study done before they file their taxes. So say we do all that, say, you know, I get a property closed by the end of the year, I get it placed in a service, I hit all of these benchmarks to get that material participation, I get my cost seg done, and I've saved all of this money. So now what do I do with this money uh, moving forward now that we've saved mm -hmm. it using all those strategies? 
So the first thing you're going to want to do is use it to accelerate your wealth building journey, right? So if I'm able to save forty, fifty thousand dollars a year in taxes, that's great. But if I take that and I completely just blow it on a car, or you know, I use it to go on a bunch of vacations, and I don't actually reinvest that money into myself or my business, you're going to struggle there. You're going to always be hunting and looking for those deductions. You're going to end up in the same spot in the following year if you don't again buy more real estate or you know generate more losses one of the things that we've been doing and it's been actually amazing this year just because of the timing is now that you've been able to lower your tax bracket so for example you know we we've, we've had clients that go from a 32 or a 35% tax bracket where if they want to do retirement contributions in a Roth Roth form they're paying 32 or 35% to contribute to a Roth retirement or do a Roth, what's called a Roth conversion. What, what's happening is they're able to lower their tax bracket down to say 12, 22, or maybe even 24%. And now they're able to do Roth conversions in their retirement accounts, be able to convert their account balance over at a lower amount. And now they're able to save hundreds of thousands, if not millions over the course of their investing journey, because they're able to convert to Roth with in low and lower tax environments. So what exactly is a Roth and a Roth conversion just for people who might not know what that is? Yeah. So there's typically two types of uh, retirement vehicles. You could have a traditional vehicle, which is you get a tax deduction when you contribute the money. However, it's going to earn and grow tax deferred, which means when you eventually take it out, you're going to have to pay taxes on that money. So for example, let's say I contributed $100,000 of traditional retirement money and it grew to a million. Well, when I go, I get a $100,000 tax deduction over the course of when I contributed the money. But when I go to pull, when I go to withdraw, I have to pay taxes on the million. Whereas a Roth, a Roth retirement account is you, you pay taxes up front on that $100,000 at whatever your tax rate is. In most people, in most people's cases, it's thirty-two or thirty-five percent. However, if you're able to use short-term rental loophole and strategy, you're able to get that down to maybe twelve or twenty-two percent. You pay taxes when you put the money in. So, for that that example, I pay twelve percent tax on a hundred grand. I pay twelve grand, and now that hundred grand grows to a million over the course of my life. I'm able to pull that million out of the retirement account completely tax-free instead of having to pay taxes on the hundred. On the one million dollars. So you're going to pay your taxes either way. It's just whether you're paying it up front on the smaller amount or if you're paying it on the back end on the larger amount. So the Roth makes more sense because you're paying it up front on the smaller amount, right? Yeah. And typically I normally recommend a if your marginal tax bracket is less than 28%, I think it makes sense to go Roth. If it's more than 28%, you're better off going traditional up front and then try to figure out on the back end how you are going to be able to offset that. And one of the interesting strategies that I'm looking to implement in my personal life is, you know, like I might be in a high 35, 37% tax bracket and I'm going to get my traditional tax deductions. But by the time I go to retire and I want to go pull that money out of my retirement account, I'm going to make sure that I qualify as a real estate professional or something that I can use the losses from that activity to offset my retirement distributions. That makes sense. So why, in what case, so be, if you're in the highest tax bracket and you're not using the Roth, you're using that traditional, uh, can you explain a little more in depth why that would make more sense uh, to do it that way that you just said, where you get, figure out how to get real estate professional status before you pull it out and all that. Just, I want to just make it crystal clear for people. Yeah. So let's say I'm single and I'm making $600,000 a year. It's going to put me in the 37% tax bracket. So I don't want to do any sort of Roth retirement accounts because I'm paying 37% essentially to put the money in. I do, however, want to do traditional retirement accounts because, hey, if I put 10 grand in, I'm going to save $3,700 in taxes that year by contributing to this retirement account. So then that 10 grand is going to earn and grow completely tax deferred. I didn't pay taxes on it up front. In fact, I got a tax deduction for it. And now it's going to grow to a sum of money who knows what it's going to grow to. Let, let's say the 10 grand grows to hundred grand and now I have to pull it out and I have to withdraw it. And that is where your tax bracket on the back end, when you go to pull it out is also important. 
Because if I'm, if I go to withdraw and I still have businesses and I still have real estate and I still have all these things, I very well could be in the same tax bracket when I go to withdraw it. And that's why I'm a big proponent of teaching people how to convert, I call it convert the bag, but take your income from your business or your W-2 and convert it to stocks and bonds, real estate, passive activities, because if all your income sources are from real estate and stocks, your tax bracket is going to be lower when you go to retire. And so then when you go to withdraw all that money that you got 37% tax deduction on, maybe you're only paying 12 or 22% to withdraw it. Gotcha. Gotcha. So the goal would be over the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, however many years until you withdraw it is to lower your tax bracket over that time so that when you pull it out, you're paying less taxes on it. Got it. Yeah. Funnel your income to sources that are going to help you create a lower tax bracket. That's why Warren Buffett says he pays less in taxes than his secretary. It's not that he pays less in taxes per dollar. But what, what's known as his effective tax rate, the amount of tax that he pays on each dollar that he earns is in fact lower than his sec, uh, secretary's effective tax rate. And it's all because of the sources that he makes his money. I tell people all the time, it's not about how much money you make, but it's how you make it. It's the vehicle and the form, the shape of how you make it. You make, you make 100 grand at your, you know, you make 500 grand at your W-2, you're paying that 37% tax. You make 400 grand, 500 grand in real estate, like my the guy that I worked for that had the apartment buildings, you could be paying zero in taxes if you're smart enough. That It's so crazy how powerful just where the money is coming from, even if it's the same number of dollars makes a difference in what, in what you have to pay. It's really fascinating. And I would never, I could never uh, be a CPA. I actually, in my MBA class, I had a lot of people who were going the the CPA route and they were taking all their hours and taking all these tests. And it just, I'm like, some of those people, I'm like, how on earth are you passing this? Because you are being a complete dumbass in class and you're able to pass. It just, it blows my mind sometimes how, how some people have numbers brains. Um, but it's really I, I fascinating a, to me. <laughs> two, I had a 2.4 and I made it. So <laughs> <laughs> It's just, you know, I, I guess it's all in your, in the mindset and, uh, and paying attention and, and, you know, the route that you end up going. Um, so let's, let's go back to that Roth thing. Are there any limitations, whether you're doing a Roth contribution or a traditional contribution, is there a limit to how much per year you can put into these types of, of accounts? Yeah. So for a 401k right now, currently in 2022, it's 20,500 is the max that you can contribute per year to a, just a, your standard 401k plan. And that's either the, the, the traditional or the Roth option. If you're over the age of, ooh, is it 50 or 55? If you're over one of those ages, you're able to do an extra six or 7,000 a year. They call it a catch-up contribution. And so you're able to basically put more money in in order to prepare for retirement. Those are the limits this year. The, the IRS just announced that they're increasing those for 2023 because of inflation. And in fact, next year, you're going to be able to put 22,500 in as opposed to 20,500. Those are your traditional 401ks. As far as your IRAs go, you this year, there's $6,000 max. And then next year, it's going to be $6,500 is the max that you can contribute to those. Um, and if you are self-employed, my favorite account is what's known as the solo 401k. So this is going to be if you're self-employed and you have no employees or you have some employees, but they're only part time and they only work less than a thousand hours for you. You're able to contribute to what's called a solo 401k, which is it, it is the best retirement account plan out there because you get the same contribution that a normal employee of a 401k does. But because you're the best employee in your business, I like to call it. <laughs> you, you're able to match your contributions. You're able to match your salary with business contributions. So I'm able to match up to 25% of my salary. So let's say I pay myself hundred grand in my business. I'm able to match myself 25% of my salary and get that as a deduction as well. So I'm able, so this year alone, you know, I was able to contribute 20,500 as an employee. And then I was able to contribute 25,000 as a business on behalf of myself I'm able to sock away $45,000 into this solo 401k account, which is super powerful because this account, and I don't think we've um, talked about this topic. I don't think you've talked about this yet, but there's a thing called self-directing your retirement account where you 
a lot of people are like, hey, let me tap into my retirement account, pull money out, take a loan out. Let me let me do this with my retirement account so that way I can buy real estate. Well, did you know that you can actually buy real estate within your retirement account? So you don't have to withdraw. You don't have to distribute. There's no loans. You can actually buy real estate within your retirement account. And so your money stays in the retirement account. And in fact, your real estate earnings will grow in comparison to that retirement account. So if I have $100,000 in a Roth solo 401k and that and I buy real estate with it and that grows to $2 million, $3 million over the course of my life, guess who gets to pull all the money out of that account completely tax-free if it's a Roth account? And I've seen people use this vehicle, the self-directing your retirement account to build a tremendous amount of wealth. I played golf with a guy who he had about $300,000 in his self-directed IRA. He, all he did was he invested in land because that's what he knew and understood. So you take your retirement account and you, you know what you find out what you, you like to do. You can do crypto, although I wouldn't recommend that. You could do, you could invest in other businesses. You can invest in various forms of real estate. You can do syndications inside of your retirement account, invest in what you know and understand. And this guy, he took $300,000 in his retirement account, self-directed it. He ended up buying a piece of the land that the Los Angeles Rams built their brand new stadium on SoFi stadium, which is like the newest NFL stadium out there. And he took his account from 300,000 to 5 million in a matter of about seven to eight years, just because he knew wow. he, he understood land and land leases and that's all he did. And so it, needless to say, if you can get, if you can self-direct your retirement account, that's awesome. But if you can self-direct a solo 401k account, it's like on steroids. It's super powerful. Okay. So let's dive into the nuts and bolts of that self-directed 401k. So let's say I've got some money in a 401k and I want to buy real estate with it. So do I, so let's say I'm going to go buy, we'll call it a short-term rental just because this is the short-term show. So let's say I want to go buy a $500,000 short-term rental. Say I've got, you know, 700,000 bucks in there just to make all these numbers work nicely. I want to go buy a $500,000 short-term rental. Do I have to pay all cash out of that IRA? I mean, sorry, out of that um, 401k? Or can I get a loan like from a bank so that I don't have to pay it, but it's mm -hmm. still within that account? Yeah, it's a good question. So you, you can buy all cash. Uh, there's nothing that prevents you from doing that. The, the problem with going all cash or buying new or doing new construction is if you run out of funds in that account, you're not able to supplement that with your own funds out of pocket because your IRA is a different taxpayer than you are essentially. And so I always caution people who are either buying in cash or who are doing new construction because the costs might run up and exceed your 401k balance. Plus if your 401k balance is up and down, up and down because of the market, you might lose, you know, you might lose that, that money and now you don't have your 500k to buy. Uh, nonetheless, there is, you actually can take out debt on behalf of your retirement account. So there are companies out there that will loan you non-recourse debt in the name of your retirement account. And so typically you have to put 30 or 40% down for this to work, but you can take debt out in the name of your retirement account. Now, why I mentioned the solo 401k, what makes, what, what makes that one stand out is let's say I have a self-directed IRA. If I take out debt with my IRA, I have to pay this thing called UDFI tax, which is basically a tax related to the debt that I took out on the property. If you have a solo 401k and you take out debt, there is no UDFI tax. For some reason, they just love the, the, four, the solo 401k where they say, hey, you don't have any sort of tax related to the debt that you take out. Um, very advanced uh, concept and topic, but the tax on these retirement accounts, if you take out debt, is tremendous. They're actually taxed at trust and estate rates and they get high very quickly, very quickly. I think after you make 15 or $20,000, you're already in a 37% bracket. Wow. So also related to that, when you say you get, you get the debt or you, you buy the house, whether you, you're buying it all cash out of the account or whether you're getting debt against it, you buy it. What happens to the income? Does the income all go back into that account or can I go spend it on a vacation? So the income is going to go all back into that account just the same way a normal retirement account would work. 
you you can take distributions from your account, but they would be subject to the same treatment, whether you had a traditional or Roth account, and then you'd be paying a 10% penalty if you're not 59 and a half. So no, no vacations out of the retirement account. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you're using it strictly, if you're buying real estate within your retirement account, you're using it strictly to grow that retirement account faster or bigger than it would have been without the real estate in there. Yeah. And, and the way I like to say it too, is you're, you're using your competitive advantage, right? Real estate, there's an intrinsic competitive advantage in real estate that you're not going to get in the stock market. If you and I both pull up Apple right now, we're going to see the same exact price. We're going to buy at the same price. Whereas you and I could go look at the same property and come up with a different set of assumptions. We're using different agents, different lenders, different attorneys, different accountants, and we could come up with a different um, deal. Like we, we could, our deals could look completely different. Maybe you have better financing than I do or vice versa. And so that is why if you have a competitive, if you feel like you have a competitive advantage in real estate, you know, think about using not all of your retirement account proceeds, but some of your retirement account to invest in, into real estate. And I typically, you know, I wouldn't, I did a webinar on the self-directed IRA a couple months ago, but I wouldn't recommend using it for your first deal. But it's like, hey, if you've done two or three deals now and you feel confident that your ability to pick and analyze deals, uh, using your retirement account could be a great way to still accelerate your wealth building. Absolutely. Hey guys, if you're enjoying the content of our podcast, but you have additional short-term rental questions, we host a weekly live question session that you guys can join for free. It's at 1 p.m. Eastern on Thursdays. And if you head over to strquestions.com, you can sign up. So not only am I the host of this show, but I also own and manage my own properties. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about short-term rental investing. So please join us anytime for a free weekly live Q&A on Zoom. Sign up at strquestions.com. So again, we're going back to what we talked about earlier in the show. So we've done, we've gotten our material participation. We've done our cost segregation. We have all this money that we've saved. Are there any other types of accounts or strategies that you want to talk about other than these few that we've already talked about that people need to be aware of? Yeah. Um, use an HSA if you guys aren't already using that. So if you work at a company that offers a HSA program, the health, it's called a health savings account, by the way. The health savings account, there is no income restriction to contributing to that account. So you can make 100000 or a million dollars and you're able to, I believe for a married couple, it's about 7300 that you can put in per year. If you're single, it's about 37, 3600 But that HSA account is really powerful because oftentimes your employer will actually help you contribute to it. But Fidelity just did a study a couple of years back where they said that the average American from retirement age to when they pass away is going to spend about $200,000 on medical expenses and medical costs, just, just medical expenses, medical costs, $200,000. And then they compared that with the average American's 401k balance. The average American's 401k balance was only 140 grand compared to the $200,000 that they need just in healthcare costs. It's not even enough to cover healthcare, let alone living, let alone, you know, travel and vacation and enjoyment. So a lot of Americans are, uh, missing out on these sort of retirement ways to retire or ways to beef up their health savings account, ways to beef up their medical expense, basically emergency fund. And the HSA is a great way to do it because you get a tax deduction for it. You can contribute up to 70, like I said, $7,300. And the best part about the HSA is it actually grows just like the Roth does. So you get to double dip. So in a traditional 401k, you get a tax deduction when you put it in but you pay taxes when you, when you go to withdraw and a Roth 401k, you're going to pay taxes when you contribute the money, but you don't pay taxes when you go to withdraw the HSA, you get the best of both worlds and that you get a d deduction when you contribute and it grows like a Roth does too, as long as you use it for qualified medical expenses. Yeah, I've always heard that and I've never actually taken the time or effort to, uh, <laughs> to implement it. But um, yeah, that's a, that's a great one as well. I've read up on quite a bit, but haven't done it. Um, any other ones that you want to touch on? Uh, the the other um, the one last thing I want to I guess we'll talk about is be very aware of the time of the year. 
So right now, you know, we got two months left in the end of the year where, and this, this could be, you know, really pertaining to the line of work that you do is, Hey, if I'm selling a house, let's, let's assume I'm selling it at a gain and I'm not going to 1031 and I'm ready to sell. Be very uh, mindful of when you actually go through with the sale. If I sell a house on December 15th and I have a gain, that tax bill is due April 15th of the following year in four months. Simply waiting until January 2nd or January 3rd to sell the property, that pushes the tax bill back all the way until the following April 15th. So simply waiting an extra two weeks to close a sale will push your tax burden back an entire 16 months. And not only that, but if you're able to sell it in the, fo in the following year, you have an entire year to tax plan around that versus if you sell a property at the end of this year, there's only so much you can do before the end of the year to be able to offset that gain. You would have already have had to plan for that sale. And so right now when real estate, you know, we're sitting on a heavily appreciated market, interest rates are up, you know, whether or not people are looking to sell or not, that's one thing to keep in mind is the timing of your events. Maybe you think you're going to make double the amount of money next year for whatever reason. Hey, maybe you want to sell it this year then because you're going to be paying less in taxes because that gain is going to be stacked on top of whatever you're making, right? Or it's, hey, I'm planning on quitting my W-2 job to, to be an entrepreneur full-time next year. I may not have that high of a tax bracket. I want to push that sale into the following year because I'll be in a lower tax bracket. But then also, too, just the timing, right? If I push the sale into the following year, I don't have to pay the tax bill for 16 months. That's really smart. I'm actually dealing with that right now. We've got two burrs that like we went over budget on. We're like, eh, let's just sell these. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to decide like, well, should we list them right now or should we wait until we know until a little bit later in the year? So there's no chance they would close this tax year. Um, so yeah, yeah. It, if you have enough depreciation, sell them this year and the depreciation will cover the gain on the burr. If you don't have enough depreciation, kick them to next year. Yeah. Or just kick them to next year anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, another thing I just bring up real quick is okay. what I'm seeing with a lot of investors is return on equity or return on, uh, I would say, cap, uh, what, is it, what was the term for that? I'm, I'm blanking. Sorry. <laughs> Opportunity cost of capital. Oh, yes. Right. So like I have, you know, I just got off the phone with a few clients this week where, hey, we bought a long term rental in New York. It only cash flows 500 a month, but it's gone up $300,000 in equity since we bought it. What do we do with it, right? And then you run these analysis of, okay, $300,000 of gain, you know, even if you were to pay 15, 20% taxes on it and, and realtor fees, you're left with 220, right? Maybe 220 versus $500 a month of cash flow. It would, it would take five, $500 a month of cash flow, six grand a year. You would have to rent that property out for like 20 years, no. 25 years just to break even on how much equity you've already generated. And so you have to do this comparison of, hey, I'm only making six grand a year versus the 220,000 of equity that's sitting on the table. Can I sell the property, level up into something that's going to provide me more cash flow for me and my family? I'm doing this analysis across the board in almost every single market. The Smokies, for example, is, is, is huge for this. Like I have clients that have bought in 18 and 19 for $250,000, and now the property's worth 850 or almost a million. And it's like, hey, you're only netting forty or fifty thousand dollars a year on this property, versus you're sitting on eight hundred thousand dollars of equity. You would have to rent this property out for sixteen years just to break even on how much equity you have in there. So then it's like, how do we exit that property as tax efficient as possible and to scale up into the next deal if that's what you want to do? And that it's also kind of a really good time in the market to be able to do that. Well, at least on the buy side. So. Um, there are more deals out there on the buy side than there were last year. Like last year, we looked at 1031 exchanging a few things a few times and we're like, well, you know, we can't, there's so much competition in the market. We can't buy anything. So why sell mm -hmm. this to try and level up if we're not going to be able to win any deals because there's a hundred people offering, but now you can find those deals and you can get under asking. It's just the, it's a little hairy on the exit because yeah, there's all this equity, but there's also a lot of fear in the market. So you might, it might, and I don't think it's anything that cancels out the equity, but it's not quite as much as it was last year, but it's still enough to where it, it can make sense to go ahead and exit that one and level up because the deals are out there on the leveling upside. 
uh, mm-hmm. because there's not as much competition in the market because people are are scared. So and that, it, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say that that's a that's a conversation I have with a lot of people is 1031 exchanging in a seller's market is very hard to do because yeah, you're selling your property, but you also have to uh, be very cautious of the timing restrictions, right? You have 45 days to identify some properties and 100, 180 days to close. In a seller's market, when real estate's just flying off, it's very hard to implement that because you might see a property and by the end of the week, it was sold. I mean, there's properties by me, even by me in you know Chicago, where that thing was listed on Thursday and it was under contract by Monday, like very quickly. And in a seller's market, it's very hard to implement a 1031 exchange. You might have to do some other sort of planning around that. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually had an example that that closed yesterday, and I'm interested to hear your answer on this. So um, one of my agents was representing the seller. Uh, The buyer was a a different firm, different, different agent. And um, this was, they were up to like the final two days of being able to close because they they 1031 exchange into pre-construction, which is not smart guys. Don't do that because new construction never finishes on time. And you're going to get in a bad situation where you might miss your closing deadline and you're stuck because Mm -hmm. you can't go re-identify something at that point. So um, they've been under contract for a while and they decided over the course of getting under contract last year and closing this year that, Hey, the market's changed and now we feel like we're paying more than we should. And the, the, the seller's like, well, I mean, the contract's the contract it appraised and all that. But what, what happened was they, we got right up to the the limit of they have to close. They had to close yesterday or else they had to pay a $75,000 tax bill. So in their negotiation with trying to get a discount off of my seller, they said, okay, we'll give you two options. You can give us this discount or you can just refund our earnest money. We'll cancel the deal. And you can give us the 75000 to pay our capital gains tax, which of course no seller will ever agree to that. But my question for a tax professional would be, say they, if someone could convince a seller to pay their capital gains tax that they made them miss, would they still have to pay income tax on that 75000 given to them by the seller? So does it, is that even an argument for a buyer to make? Mm. That's a good question. So how how are they giving 75 grand? Is, well, is it well, sure? Yeah. So they wouldn't, and nobody would agree to that. But hypothetically, they would have just given them cash, uh, 75 cash to pay their capital gains with. I would assume that this, I would, without looking into it, I would assume that the 75 would be a capital gain too. Yeah. So, so you, they would, so guys, when you go out there and negotiate, looking for a discount, just understand that even if you, if you try to go that route with a seller, you're, you're going to have to pay capital gains tax anyway. I I can't imagine that any seller would ever agree to pay capital gains just because a a buyer wants a discount. But anyway, Mm. it was a situation we we ran into this week that I was like, can they, even if the seller were going to do that, could they actually, would that actually benefit them in any way? They'd have to pay taxes anyway. So the things you run into in real estate, but they did close though. They did close and everything was fine, but, and they did get a discount. <laughs> so, um, anyway, that, so we are, we've been going here about 30 minutes and we're to the, the last or maybe more than 30, 40, uh, last three questions of our show. So we ask these questions to every single person. And the first one is what advice would you give 20 year old Ryan? Um, to, so I would say find a mentor, find a mentor and find multiple mentors. Actually, in fact, find mentors in different areas of your life. Uh, so there's this book that a guy named Zig Ziglar wrote that he called the wheel of life. And it's seven different pillars in your life that you want to set goals and you want to achieve them in. And so some of those wheels of life are your family goals, fitness goals, you know, career goals, money goals, uh, spiritual goals. Find what those goals mean to you and find mentors that can help you get there. So for example, I have multiple mentors in different areas of my life. I have other CPAs that are my coaches. Uh, You've probably met them before. I have, you know, I have uh, investor mentors that will say, Hey, you know, like I had, I had a phone call with my mentor a couple of weeks ago. He goes, don't buy that deal. It's not a good deal. And I go, why? He goes, well, your, your, your expenses related to your revenue, something's off there. Something seems fishy. If he, you know, he's, dozens of years of experience in multifamily and he's going to tell me that it's not a good deal. I'm not doing it. Right. Right. I have a, I have a mentor for 
just life, you know, a life coach. I have a mentor for fitness, right? I'm really big into lifting weights in the gym. Find a mentor because they've already been, they're either at or they've already been through where you want to be and where you want to go in life. And they're, they can give you advice because the worst thing that you can do is make the mistake on your own because it's the, it costs the most amount of time, the most amount of money most of the time. Whereas if you have a mentor that's already been there, they can guide you in a different direction. And that, I don't know if I'm stealing your thunder, but that leads me into mm -hmm. my, my, my choice of my book is uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He, habit number two is begin with the end in mind. Picture yourself at the finish line of the deal or where it is you want to be. And what are the steps that you have to work back to get there? Having a mentor, they're already at the finish line. They can give you advice on what are the steps that you maybe need to get there. Uh, how, how do you get there? So like one of the things that I want to do when I was in college was I want to be a CFO of the Chicago Cubs. Okay, let's look at this guy. What does he, what does he do? Well, he's a CFO now. You know, he went to this school, got a CPA, went to a big four accounting firm, did this, did that. Okay, here's the steps I need to take if I want to end up like this person, right? Or so-and-so has 10 deals, you know, $5 million net worth. How, what did he do? Okay, he started small, leveled up, got experience and kept going. And so you, you can apply that mentorship across the board and don't, don't be cheap on mentors. You can find them for free if you just go to you know, local real estate meetings or just find somebody to take you under their wing. But also don't, don't feel ashamed of paying for it too. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, uh, there's certainly no shame in paying for it. If, if you can find it and that person has the experience, it's well worth the money. And um, yeah, your book recommendation, that's, you would think that that would be one that a lot of people would have recommended, but I think we're right around our hundredth show right now. And nobody has recommended seven high habits of highly effective people. It's a good mm. one. Great one. Definitely need to read that. Uh, okay. And last question, what advice would you give a new investor who's looking to get started today at the end of 2022, the way the market is right now? This might trigger some people, but I would say <laughs> don't, don't wait to invest, invest in wait. And it's because, if you look at the lifespan of an investor, whether that's in the stock market or real estate or whatever it is, asset class, the people who lose are the people who exit the game for a long period of time and they're not continuously investing. And the reason I know this is I've studied accounting and finance. And so for example, like Fidelity, Fidelity did a study, uh, two studies actually, they said the, the account criteria balance of people who accumulated the most money in their retirement accounts. Can you get, can you guess what the, what the criteria was? No, I would feel like also it's a trick question. <laughs> it was, it was dead people. So over a span of 20 years, people who died had the highest account balance, highest return on their money. And it's because they said it and they forget it and they continuously, their account just did the work for them. They, they were just investing into it. The second criteria of people who had the highest return was people who forgot their login information. And so if this tells you anything about dollar cost averaging, dollar cost averaging is, hey, I'm gonna take 10% of my paycheck, I'm gonna invest it in the stock market, in real estate, into this, consistently over, over the period of 20 to 30 years, even if you buy at, even if you buy at a high market, as long as the, the property is going to cash flow, and you can do that over a period of time, you're going to become wealthy over 20, 30 years. The person who loses is the person that says, oh, I'm gonna wait for the market to go back up. Well, if you buy when the, mar or when the stock market, right? If you buy when it's back up, how are, you, how are you gonna know, number one, when it's gonna be at its very lowest? How are you gonna know when it's actually trending up? You don't. So that's why you just invest now and be able to weather that storm. So if you're investing now, your carrying costs have to be higher, you have to you know, make sure your deal pencils out a little bit smarter, factor in your higher insurance costs, property taxes, et cetera, but continuously invest. And so there's never a wrong time to buy real estate. There's only a wrong time to sell it. I totally agree with that. And my um, assistant is texting me on the side saying, oh, you fit into that second category of forgetting your password because I always have to message her and say, what's my <laughs> password to this one? <laughs> I, and I actually do. I was thinking when you said that, I'm like, I literally have not logged into my Charles Schwab account in like two years and I don't even know how to. But see, if you, if you were, if you were logged into that, especially during the pandemic and COVID and they're like, the government's like, oh, you could take money out of there and you don't have to pay any penalties. All these people did that. 
all these people pulled money out of their retirement accounts during the pandemic. And it, you know, if they weren't actually using that money for more investments or what things that they needed to do, they were robbed of their future because that's tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands that could have been earning and growing for them. That is now not so. Also really, really great advice. Well, thanks so much for coming on. I think that a lot of people are going to get a lot of value out of this episode and we really appreciate your time. So for people who want to learn more about you, maybe check out your courses and your content, where can they find you? Yeah. So it's going to be social media. It's going to be at learn like a CPA. So that's going to be TikTok, Twitter, Instagram. I have a Facebook group. It's called tax strategies for real estate investors. We got about 4,000 real estate investors in there now. And you can also check out my website for some free tools. So I have STR deal calculators. I have long-term rental calculators. I have material participation time logs. I have everything on my website. That's going to be just learnlikeacpa.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Ryan, for coming on and we will catch you later. Yeah. Thank you guys.